Okay, good evening everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to talk to you about this important issue of climate change. It's a, it's a topic that I've actually worked on for about 20 years. And a lot has changed in that time. A lot has changed in the last 20 years on this topic. For one, we have a much clearer idea of the severity of the crisis. Um, but we've also made tremendous advances on technological and policy solutions on this issue. In recent years, there's been exponential growth in clean energy technologies, in solar and wind, in the installations. There's been a rapid decline in energy, the cost of energy storage. And there also has been new technologies in Earth observations and com compute capacity that allows us now to track, monitor, and manage the climate forcings associated with deforestation and other land use and land cover changes, which we could barely imagine would be true about 20 years ago. So the momentum that we're seeing today on this issue is really encouraging. But the question is, is it enough? Is it enough to outpace the exponential growth in human impacts on the, that we're having on the climate system? Climate change is, being, is caused by human activities such as the burning of fossil fuels, the clearing of forests and other landscapes, industrial activities that release gases to the atmosphere that trap heat that would otherwise escape to space and, uh, and causes the temperatures to rise. And not only temperatures rise, but also changes in the, uh, um, in the climate systems, in the, in the basic climate systems that affects almost every aspect of of human society. And why? Because the climate affects every aspect of human society. Climate affects the air we breathe, the water we drink, how we grow our food, where we live, where, how we grow our, run our businesses. And so this is, we're just beginning to really understand the implications of these changes for how we live today and for our children's lives and our grand, their grandchildren's lives. Over the last 50 years, the um, the growth in these greenhouse gases, principally carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide, has increased exponentially. And the question, and we're really at a critical time now, because right now we have only a few years, really, before we have to start bending down the curve on the emissions of these critical gases, if we are going to be able to still stabilize the climate at a level which the international scientific and policy community together have deemed as, um, as safe. So we're really in this race, this race against sort of the exponential growth and innovation, not just in technology, but in policies and um, social economic issues, against the exponential impacts that we're seeing in the climate system. And that's what I want to talk about today, is you know, where are we on this race? And how, what, is, what does it look like in terms of um, where we're going to end up? And I want to explore this by asking four questions. First, how much climate change is dangerous, in other words, to, where are we headed in this race? How fast do we have to reduce emissions to avoid dangerous climate change? So how fast do we have to run to win the race? Can we reduce emissions that fast? And finally, if we can do it, how will we do it? So I want to just say a few words about each of these to frame up the, frame up the issue. First, how much climate change is dangerous? Well, it turns out this is actually um, a difficult question to answer because Climate change doesn't change uniformly across the globe. It changes in some places of the world, they would say, we've already crossed dangerous climate change. Um, but it's not only that it doesn't impact different places in the world because the changes in the climate are different across the globe, but also people and ecosystems have a different ability to adapt and respond to the changes that are unfolding. So answering this question is actually quite difficult. Having said that, the international scientific and policy community had to be pushed to answer this question. Because to advance the policy, so it was, to advance global policy and agreement, it was critical. And so the focus has been around this idea of two degree rise above pre-industrial levels as being the definition of, of, cli of dangerous climate change. Now, having said that, in Paris this past year, um, or not this past year, in 2015, there was a focus and push to say, no, two degrees is too, is too much warming. Because the most vulnerable regions in the world said, we can't, we can't live with two degrees. 
we need to have 1.5 degrees in the, in, in the policy agreement. And it was put in there. Um, you know, two degrees is going to be hard to make. Um, 1.5 will be that much harder. And this is a graph from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change called the Urban, Ur Burning Embers graph, which has been a version of this in every intergovernmental climate change report, more or less. And the categories aren't necessarily specifically important, but the, what's important of this is I said it was hard to aggregate across the whole globe and think about what is dangerous climate change. But this is what they did because they had to do this in terms of the international policy discussions. And we, there's five different sort of buckets, if you will, of characterizations of risks. And the main thing to take away is if you aggregate all the risks at a global scale, if you look above two degrees, things get really red and purple. That means things are more dangerous. And that's sort of the simple story of why two degrees. So let's say we now have two degrees as our, is sort of dangerous climate change, is the, the end goal, if you will, not the end goal, but in terms of this race, this, this near-term race. The question is, well, how much more of these heat-trapping gases can we emit? if we are going to stay, keep the temperature rises ab, uh, below this two degrees above pre-industrial levels. Well, the scientific analysis shows that from pre-industrial levels till the time we reach the two degree threshold, we can admit about 2,900 2, gigatons of CO2. And between eight, 1870 and 2011, we have had admit 65% of this budget or 1,900 gigatons of CO2. But, and this, was, this came out in the last IPCC report. But time has passed since then, and now we've emitted 72% of the budget and have only 800 gigatons of CO2 remaining in, in the budget before we cross this threshold of two degrees, which has been determined as the um, threshold of danger. So in terms of how much climate change is dangerous, what is that milestone that we're facing in this race? Two degrees is what the global community is sort of focused on with a 1.5 caveat, if you will. And 800 gigatons per, of CO2 is what we have left in our budget. So given that, how fast do we have to reduce our emissions to avoid this threshold? The second question. Well, recently, a few months ago, there was a great paper that came out in, um, in the scientific journal Science by Johan Rockström and Owen Gaffney and others, which really set out to set a practical plan to implement the, uh, the uh, Paris Agreement. And in their analysis showed that uh, what they called this, uh, the carbon law after Moore's law in the IT sector, um, that we have, to, we have to focus on reducing emissions. If everybody reduces emissions by half, cuts emissions in half, every decade, we will be on track to, um, to avoid the two, degree, uh, the two, to two degree threshold. And this is a, a simple model because we can do this at the global scale, at the national scale, the city scale, at the company scale, having this target. Now, uh, it, we, we also have to think about sinks in terms of th those storage and, and sources where that captures uh, 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 the the carbon in forests, for example, and other landscapes um, and other areas. But the big piece here is reducing emissions by uh, cutting emissions in half every decade. So then the question is, well, can we reduce emissions this fast? That's pretty fast. Well, the good news is, in Paris in 2015, 190 plus nations came together and said, we, we are committing to do this. We are committing to avoid two degrees and actually, in fact, to work towards avoiding 1.5 degrees. Now, the picture on the side here is the commitments that they actually made. And the way this was structured is, is it, wasn't, it didn't say the, the, the structure of the Paris Agreement wasn't we have to get to two degrees, how are we going to divvy up the challenge among the nations? The structure of this agreement was we have to get to two degrees. We know we want to. Let's tell you what we can do from a bottom up and say, what can we do at this stage? So this isn't very encouraging if you look at this because it suggests that, well, it doesn't look like we're on track. These are, these are, these are the emission trajectories given the commitments of reductions of each of the, the four top nations of the world. And that's not even all the emissions of the country. And so you can see that we are actually popping up above the, the pathway that would be needed for, to keep on a two degree trajectory. 
but this is, this is okay. And the reason it's okay is because the structure of the Paris Agreement was such that it required people to come back and rethink their am ambition every five years as they have new information about what's possible in their economy and in the global economy. And the good news is, is that we know that the, the actual growth in clean energy, the actual changes on the ground, actually are outpacing the projections of governments and intergovernmental organizations. So this is the actual growth of solar um, capacity in over the last 15 years. And this is the projections of the International um, Energy Agency, which you can see is way off um, from the actual growth. So this is encouraging news. And if you take this, this projection, now this is an interesting slide because it shows how small renewables is in terms of the global energy production today. It's actually just a fraction. However, but if you take the, the, the scale of growth in this region, the scale of growth of, of doubling every 5.4 years, and you bring that out, then if we are able to keep up that pace, we could have a um, largely renewable energy sector by mid-century. Now, this isn't going to happen by itself. There's a lot of work that has to be done, but it is encouraging to see that there is a trajectory of exponential growth if we are able to keep it up. So how do we do it? How do we keep up this pace? Um, well, coming back to the paper I mentioned earlier, which I think is a helpful framework, uh, in the context of the carbon law. There's, there's three different components that we ha do have to think about all of them uh, together. One is uh, the halving of emissions every decade. The other is protecting the carbon sinks, the natural, the natural stores of carbon, for, for example, our forest, and then is creating new carbon sinks. But let me break down the, the, uh, this a little bit more in terms of how much each of these different components contribute to the emissions challenge. This is again from the IPCC recent report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which breaks down the emissions by sector. And you can see that if you add electricity, which is in yellow, energy and transport, which is driven mainly by energy as well, the energy sector is about 50%. Um, oftentimes it's seen as the whole thing, but it's not. There's a big, there are big factors outside of energy that actually drive the, this change. But it's a, it's a big part of it. In fact, if we could change the electricity sector to clean energy, we would, have a hu we would solve a lot of problems because we can um, uh, shift then the transport sector to electricity. A lot of things we can change then to, um, to be electric and, and solve a big chunk of this problem. And we have made a lot of advances, as I mentioned. We're, we, we, we're on a trajectory that if we could keep it up and, and, and empower that further, it, it is encouraging. And we're also making parallel um, uh, progress in the, in the transport sector in terms of the shift of electricity, uh, electric vehicles. Still very, very early stages. But, but note uh, there is an uh, encouraging trend that um, is developing now, and we just need to see that. And finally, in terms of the um, uh, land use and land cover change areas, uh, you know, I think that there's lots of advances in the context of Earth observations, big data analysis, which is tra transforming how we can manage this, this, uh, this area. And the big issue here that we need to do, I think, is um, not, we need to continue to focus to advance these individual technologies, but the really big transformation will be working across the different sectors to deploy these technologies and really change the, uh, the broader systemic approach to how these are applied and, and implemented in practice. And this is one of the things that we're doing at, with Future Earth in collaboration with the Stockholm Resilience Center and, and, in, and a recent collaboration at Intel, very early stages. But one of the things that we do is bring together scientists, researchers, and innovators to work and focus on identifying the problems and, and identifying scalable solutions to the problems um, on global sustainability issues. And one of the things we're starting is something called the Carbon Law Accelerator that's focused on trying to bring together the tech sector, sector and researchers to identify what are those opportunities to drive innovation and, and put 
decarbonization at the center of the fourth industrial revolution. Because we believe that if we cannot just have the tech sector focus on having clean industries themselves, but actually focus their innovation on solving these problems, we'll go a long way. So, in summary, um, I posed the question at the beginning, will exponential innovations overcome the climate crisis? And my short answer is, well, I'm optimistic, but time is running out. We have we're, this clock, we're eating away at this carbon budget very, very quickly, and we need to slow that down. But I do believe that to, drive, to, to beat the clock, we need to drive disruptions across all sectors of society um, and to follow the carbon law. That is to reduce, cut emissions in half every decade. And I believe that putting decarbonization at the center of the fourth industrial revolution, the cyber revolution, is an opportunity to drive such changes. Thank you. Thank you.